seated. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, church. I want to give you a, a positive announcement. Uh, last week, uh, we had been requested to pray for Bill Shahan, his daughter Kylie, and her boyfriend Jaden had come by on Friday and made that request, and they were worshiping with us last Sunday, and, and they're here with us again today. And I asked her how her father was doing. Her father was diagnosed in December with terminal cancer, and she was asking for our prayers last week and for you to continue to pray, and I know that you have and that our elders have. How difficult it was, not only in his sickness, but the fact that he was in West Virginia and she was in Alaska. And, and what a difficulty uh, that presented. But I asked her how he was doing today, and she said, better. He's doing better. So thank you, church, for your prayers. Keep praying. Remember Bill Shahan in your prayers and uh, his uh, children who are here. Um, wonderful whenever we can, can give good reports. And you're to be thanked for, for your involvement. We've been studying the last several weeks about the death of Christ. Whenever Jesus tells us about the Lord's Supper, and then later in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, whenever the Apostle Paul is, is explaining again to the church at Corinth what takes place whenever we come together, the very focal point of our worship, what we have just experienced together, what we participated in together, the Lord's Supper, the communion. Jesus said that as often as we take of this bread in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26, he said, as often as you, you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim his death until he comes. The very focal point of our worship, the very focal point of our lives, and, 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 and seriously, the, the very focal point of all human history was the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus. And His death was necessary. We talked about that last week. Why, why did someone have to die? He had to die because of sin. Sin is the problem that we have. Michael talked about that just a moment ago. Sin is the, is the problem we have. Death has come about by sin, what we were just talking about just right before that. And, and there, there's physical death and there's spiritual death. We, we covered that last week. And, and, and that's, that's significant. Every one of us is going to die physically unless Jesus returns first. There have only been a few people that never died physically. One of them that we read about in the Bible was, was Enoch, who walked with God and, and was no more. And we read about him in, in, in Genesis chapter 5. Another was Elijah, a great prophet of God. And, and God took him to heaven uh, in a whirlwind. And, and he never experienced death. And, and there, may, there may have been others that God just doesn't tell us about, but those he did tell us about, everyone else... Everyone else, including the Son of God, had to die physically. God says that that's, that's here because of, of sin. Whenever a man ate of the tree that God had commanded him not to eat of it, God said the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. You'll surely die. Now, man didn't die immediately physically. That's a reminder. Physical death is a reminder of, of our spiritual relationship and spiritual a condition before God. But man did die spiritually that day. And what death simply means is a separation. It's a separation from life. It's, it's not a separation from, from awareness, from consciousness. I mean, as long as we're alive in the flesh, we know that we're alive in the flesh. And we are told in the New Testament that whenever we die, that we're still aware. We're aware that we're no longer among the, those who are living in the flesh. And we, and we read about that in, in Jesus' own teaching about the rich man and Lazarus. Or the Apostle Paul saying that it, it'd, be better, it'd be better to go on. He's talking about dying. It'd be better to go on uh, and, and be with the Lord than, than to live in this life, even though he, he was caught between the two. You know, what should I want to do in, in Philippians chapter 1? Should I want to, to continue to live in the flesh so that I can help you as my brothers and sisters? 
Or should I want to go ahead and, and, and die and be with the Lord? So there, there is an awareness uh, e even in death. There, it, is, it is not a separation from, from awareness. It's just a separation from life in the flesh. That's what physical death is. Spiritual death is a separation from God. And there's still awareness there. Awareness of whenever you're right with God, and there will be awareness in, in, in eternal judgment whenever you're not right with God. And that's the great tragedy that, uh, that, uh, that each one of us are seeing lived out, and maybe even lived out in your own life, in the lives of people of this world. Judgment is coming. It's coming because of sin, but judgment is coming. And God says so much about judgment. And whenever we talk about the death of Jesus, we must also talk about judgment. For, for that's the reason He came into this world. He said, I've come into this world for judgment. I've come to... And, and He came and He pronounced judgment upon sin. He pronounced judgment upon Satan. He pronounced judgment upon death. But whenever we come together and partake of the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim, we're telling the world, we're announcing to the world that Jesus died. And it was necessary that, that someone die because we have all sinned. The wages of sin is death. Is death. It's not just sickness. It's not just a little bit of suffering. God tells us in, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. And every one of us have sinned in, in chapter 3, back up a few chapters in Romans, and God tells us we've all sinned. And so that's, that's where we are today in, in, in our lessons about the, the Lord's Supper, that we announce His death until He comes. Now we had hold up, rather talk about the resurrection because that's more exciting. We don't rather talk about the day whenever Jesus is going to come back and, and all of His own are, are going to go with Him. He's going to come back to receive us unto Himself. That's His own words in John chapter 14. That if, if I go, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And in Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, just a few chapters later in, in the Gospel of John, that was John 14 about Jesus saying that I'm going to come back and receive you to Myself. In John chapter 17, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is praying to the Father. He said, I want them to be where I am. I want them to be with me. I want them to see my glory. I want them to see you. This, this is why Jesus came, so that we could be with Him forever and forever. But don't mistake. Don't mistake what God is saying. Don't let someone convince you otherwise judgment is coming i want us to read just a few verses about that i want us to read about the situations that god talks about that will have direct bearing upon each one of us if we reject jesus christ i want us first to go to second peter i want you to begin with in second peter we could also read the book of jude a very short book to me the most frightening book in all of the bible the book of Jude, one of the shortest books in the Bible, but to me one of the most frightening because it talks about judgment, 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 judgment. And evidently man is a slow learner because we haven't learned from past mistakes, from the past examples of judgment. It, but Second Peter chapter 2 tells us essentially the same thing as the book of Jude. Begin in verse 4 and listen to what God said. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Now, we don't, we don't know when all of that took place. Maybe that took place before we were ever created. Maybe it took place during the early days of, of, of the history of man, whenever God made man and placed him in the garden. I, we, we don't know the exact time framework of when this happened, but God tells us that those created beings in His presence, angels are created, that they had choice. And they chose no longer to live in submission to God. Now Jude will say they chose not to keep their first estate. God, God moved them into His, uh, into his estate. He, he moved them in. He didn't just make them. He made them and let them live with Him. And God tells us that now in God's presence there is an innumerable 
company of angels. There's not any way for you to count them. I mean, we're learning bigger and bigger words every day. I wish those, in bigger and bigger numbers, I wish those numbers didn't apply to our national debt, but, but they do. We're learning big numbers, and, and, and it already blows our mind. But God says you cannot count the number of angels that are there in His presence. That, that, to me, that's incredible. But some of the angels that God created made a choice no longer to live with God. They were no longer to, going to submit to God. And so God judged them. And He said they sinned. You see, that was their problem too. The angels that sinned, God took them. And Second Peter says, He cast them into hell. And then He describes what that was. That was a pit of darkness. Mark that word. We're going to talk more about darkness next week. And you're, you're often, often you're going to find darkness associated with the judgment of God against sin. You see, God created light. Remember, that's, that's, a, that's the first thing that, that He did after He had made the world. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. That's interesting. God loses me so quickly whenever I study the Bible. He doesn't, I mean, He doesn't lose, lose my... He blows my mind. Because in Genesis chapter 1... God tells us that in the beginning, on the first day, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And the morning and the evening was the first day. On the first day, God created light. He doesn't create the sun, the moon, the stars till day number four. Hmm. Now, I'm not really smart about science. Even though it doesn't always show, I'm a whole lot smarter with math. That'll give you a gauge of, of really how dumb I am about science. And, but I, I can count, and day number one, God creates light, but day number four, He creates sun, moon, and the stars. And He separates the, the light and the darkness. And He makes the sun to rule over the day and the, the moon to rule over the light. And he made the stars also. You take the sun, the moon, and the stars away, and it's dark. Let me tell you for a fact, you take the sun, the moon, and the stars away, and it's dark. You cannot even see your hand in front of your face. And so I say, what light did God create on the day number one? Didn't create sun, moon, and stars for the day number four. You see, see God, God is already, and of course that's the way it should be, because He's God and I'm not. His ways are so far above my ways. But God created light. And if you're out of the presence of God, you are in darkness. You are in darkness. And Jesus tells us in, in the Sermon on the Mount, if your eye is single, if you're focused on God, if you're focused on Jesus, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. If your eye is single and you're looking to Jesus, then the light that is in you will be great. But if you're double visioned, if your light, if your eye is not single, the light that is in you will be darkness. And how great that darkness is. So God creates light. And, and, but these angels, come back now to where we are. These angels that rebelled against God, that sinned, not just made a mistake, not, not just had bad feelings, but they sinned. That God has cast them into a pit of darkness and He's put them in chains and He's keeping them there until the end of the world when He will take them out of that pit and put them in the devil's hell. That's serious. And the reason God's telling us about that is to, so He gets our attention about judgment. He's wanting us to know the expense of sin. The wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, because we're all going to taste of that, but spiritual death, separated from God. Read on with me, if you will. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And he did not spare the ancient world, but pres preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly, God totally destroyed all flesh. When he destroyed the world with flood, 
except Noah and his family and all the animals that were in the ark. And the water was upon the face of the earth for almost a year. It rained for 40 days and nights. And after that, the water had covered, we talked about this two weeks ago, the water had covered the highest mountain 22 feet, 15 cubits, 22 feet above the tallest mountain, the water had covered the earth. And the water was upon the face of the earth for 150 days before God pulled the drain. And it takes another 150 days for the water to go down to where the the ark will finally settle on top of a mountain. And then it takes 40 more days before there's the water's gone enough to where Noah will send a bird out to find out. The, the, the water covered the earth for almost a year. That's a deep, soaking cleansing. You get a stain in something, what did your mother do? I mean... She didn't just spray stuff on back then. She had to rub stuff in. Rub it into the stain. Maybe it was a powder and she'd mix it and rub it into the stain. And then what'd she do with it? Come on. Soak it. <laughs> you, you soak it. You got, you got trouble with something that's white and, and, and you've, you've, uh, you're, you're a freshman guy and you've just started college and you do your laundry for the first time and, and you, you wash your red gym shorts with, with all your undershirts. And now you've got pink undershirts. And you're going, oh no, what in the world do I do? So you start asking for help. You've got to use some bleach. And you mix the right amount of bleach. Don't mix too much because you mix too much, you won't have undershirts. So we go through a learning experience. But what you do is you mix the right amount of bleach with the water and then you let those things soak for a little while. Let me tell you what, there was so much sin in the world that God said it's going to take a while for all of this to be gone. For everybody's body to decay. For it all to sink to the bottom of the ocean. For silt to cover it. For clay to cover it. And we're finding evidence of of life deep down in the earth beneath things. I mean, archaeologists are finding... And we're finding cities that that are are underwater. Out in in, in the the oceans. You know, on on the... not too far from some of, some of the, the banks of, like the Black Sea, we're finding submerged cities. And, and off the coast of China, we're finding submerged cities. And, and, and all around the Mediterranean, we're finding, what happened? Well, that's the remnants of the flood. Let me tell you for a fact. And it took a while for it. That, that's a pretty dirty world, wasn't it? God said in Genesis chapter 6 that the evil of man was so, ho- was so bad, it was so bad that every thought of the imagination in his heart was evil continuously. And God only found one family. In fact, he only found one man. And because of that man, his family. And the Bible says it grieved God. God grieves over our sins. It grieved God, and it repented Him. He repented for even making man. But He had made a promise, hadn't He? He had made a promise that through the the seed of woman, the Savior of the world would come, and God keeps all of His promises. Let me tell you what, what God is saying here about judgment is real. And it says, If He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, in verse 6, to destruction by reducing them to ashes having made them an example of those who would live ungodly, uh, ungodly lives thereafter, and he did. We think, we think the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are buried beneath the Dead Sea. It's about the right place for them to be. We think that they're probably buried beneath the Dead Sea. And that would really be appropriate, not only the name of the sea, but, but where... Where, but God destroyed them. He obliterated those cities with fire from heaven. And God says, I use that as an example for every generation that follows that my judgment against sin is real. God's saying, I want your attention. 
Does he have your attention this morning? Listen to what he says as he continues now in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. He says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the un- listen to this part, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authorities. I tell you what, people are in trouble today. People are in trouble today. I may not like some of the things that you do. I may not like some of the laws that we have in our country, but God has ordained that there be rule and that there be authority. Now, those authorities are going to have to answer to God. They don't have to answer to me. I need to be careful with my mouth. Church, we need to be careful with our hearts. Some of the things I hear my brothers in Christ saying today, I know it's in an environment where words are, are, are thrown back and forth at each other and, and horrible things are said and so many things are said that simply are not true. But they're being said by people who have no respect for authority. God said that His destruction of the world of Noah and his destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are an example that he wants us to remember. This is serious. And it all comes into play and should all come into our thoughts when we're talking about the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, when you eat the bread and drink the cup, you announce my death. Why did Jesus have to die? Because of sin. Whose sin? Ours. What was our sin deserving of what is the payment for our sin death second thessalonians chapter one listen to what god says second thessalonians chapter one beginning in verse seven the church was being persecuted and god says this to them and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the lord jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire now jesus already said i'm coming back in john 14 But God says, I want you to know there's two things going to happen when Jesus comes back. And he'll deal with that in this reading that we're reading this morning. He he will talk about the, the, the Christians those who are believers in Jesus Christ, those who are followers of God, are are going to be standing there in wonder and amazement in seeing the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time, really seeing Him in all of His glory. And if you're not one of His children... He's still coming, but he's coming with with mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's serious. God's judgment against sin is serious. And here he says it's going to come on on two different groups of people. Number one, on those who do not know God. Now, some people have known God, and they choose no longer to retain God in their knowledge, is what Romans chapter 1 tells us, beginning in verse 18. People who do not know God and, and those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ are going to be destroyed with eternal destruction from the presence of God. God's going to send them away. And where are they going to go? God will call it several different things, but one of the places... One of the ways he refers to it is outer darkness. In fact, it's not just called outer darkness. It's actually referred to as the outer darkness, as a specific kind of darkness, a very specific kind of place, the outer darkness. Serious. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Listen to what he says beginning in verse 42. This is what Jesus is saying about sin beginning in, in, in verse 42. Whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble. Oh, we could talk all day about that. We could get real upset about that. Some of the things that are being taught in our public schools to our little children. You know one of the claims that, that, that people who do not believe in God and believe in a deviant form of life? The people who, who, have, who, champion, who champion the gay and lesbian ideas? The ones who say men and men should be able to marry and women and women should be able to marry, regardless of what God says in Romans chapter 1. 
it, that it's, it's wrong. When, now we've even come up with, with transgender. And they said, we don't have to worry about you grown-up people to talking about people of my age. 30 years ago, they were saying, we don't have to worry about people your age because we're going to get your children. We're going to get your children. We're going to get your children and your grandchildren because we're going to start teaching them these things as though that's the way life really should be. I tell you what, God, Jesus is saying these things 2,000 years ago. Listen to what he says. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone was hung about his neck and if they were cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Cut it off. It'd be better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into the hell and into unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It'd be better for you to enter into life lame than having two feet and be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out or pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. You see, what God's talking about is real. It's real. And every bit of this comes into play and should come into our mind whenever we're announcing to the world the Lord's death. Someone had to die. And Jesus chose to die in our place. We deserved it. The judgment upon sin. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34, Jesus says to them, we're not going to read all these verses. Matthew chapter 25 verse 34, Jesus said to those on his right hand, he's talking about the eternal judgment where he has all nations, all people of the world gathered before him and he's going to divide them as, as you would divide the sheep from the goats. And he's going to say to those, on his right hand, come you blessed, you who are blessed of my Father. Come you who are blessed of my Father. Inherit, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come you blessed of my Father. And then just a few verses later, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, he's going to say to those on the other side, he's going to say, depart from me. Depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire judgment the world don't want to hear about that the world don't want to hear about that one one of the things i hear almost as much as 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 all of the the lies that are being said i hear people saying don't you judge me don't you judge me i even sometimes in our in our counseling when judy and i are working with couples sometimes you'll hear one of them say to the other one don't you judge me and we're quick to, to say things like that. And the truth is, I'm not judging you. I'm not judging anyone. I'm going to be judged. I'm going to be right there with you. I'm going to be judged. God is going to be the one who judges us. Jesus Christ is the one who's either going to say, Depart from me, or come. Come, you who are blessed of my Father. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to seek and to save. To save us from what? To save us from what? He's a Savior of the world. To save us from what? God so loved the world. Michael did a great job with that this morning. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Perish why? Why? To save me from what? Listen to what Romans chapter 5 says, beginning in verse 8. We could read all of it. I'll encourage you to read all of Romans chapter 5. But listen to what verse 8 and 9 says. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we are saved from the wrath of God by him say from what from God's wrath God's wrath against sin not not against you not against you it's not that God despises you 
It's not that God singled you out of everybody in the world and, and, and he's doing mean things. God is not mean. God's only son died. We're to announce that to the world. He died to save us, all of us, from the wrath of God. The righteousness of God cannot tolerate sin. Oh, there's so much here. So much here. When we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim His death. He saved us from the wrath of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 says, The wrath of God is revealed against all of the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. The wrath of God is there because of sin. Not that God committed, but that we commit. That we commit. We'll talk more about that. We'll talk more about what about those innocent bystanders. And there are some of those. Sometimes we suffer because of what other people have done. doesn't mean you're guilty. We'll talk more about that later. God's wrath is revealed against sin. Jesus Christ came into the world, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, to save sinners. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against sin. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. That's us. And where he saved sinners was on the cross. It was on the cross. That's why we talk about the cross. We don't talk about the cross enough. This is it. God says when you come together on the first day of the week and you eat of the bread and you drink of the cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death. You're proclaiming the cross to the world until he comes. You're proclaiming it also to yourself. You see, someone had to die. Someone had to die. And God made the choice. God made the choice. Jesus made the choice that it doesn't have to be you. Isn't that cool? Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that worth telling people about? That God made the choice, you don't have to die. You don't have to be cast into outer darkness where the worm doesn't die. What is he saying? It's going to be forever. And, and, and where the fire's not quenched. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You don't have to go there. God made that choice for you. Jesus died so that you would not have to. The question is, what choice are you going to make? Hmm. What choice are you going to make? Are you going to accept that? Are you going to stand with the world and say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Choose. Choose. If you haven't already made the choice, I hope you make that choice today. If we can help you, come right now while we stand and sing. Well, Jesus whispers to you, come, sinner, come, while we are praying.
Please be seated. Good morning. Uh, Brother Jack Lyons come forward today. Um, as you know, Brother Jack came to us from Buffalo, New York, and uh, he's, he was hoping to put in his years here of service and, and get a transfer to Albuquerque. And he's been informed that that is now going to take place. He should be there by uh, May 1st of 2016. But he also wants us to notice to put a lot of stress on his family and that uh, he wants to continue to serve God uh, in his new location. He loves his family and he hopes and pray that, um, that some spiritual changes will be made in her life as well, his wife's life as well. Um, there are some things he said, I don't think you want those said here. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because of this um, relocation, it has brought a lot of stress on his family and uh, uh, to the point where uh, his marriage is, is, is not going to be much longer. He's anticipating a divorce there because of this. So he wants us to keep him in his prayers, keep Ileana, Ileana in, in your prayers as well. Uh, he's wishing the best for her. He loves her. He wants her to come to know the Lord. He would love to have his family stay together. And that could happen. That could happen. So let us pray. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we love you so very much. And Heavenly Father, we know that you have been blessing Jack in numerous ways and that you were with him in his relocation here to Alaska. You were with him as he found a new bride. You've been with him, Father, as he uh, completed his obligations here in Anchorage, Father, in his job, and he was successful in securing that relocation to Albuquerque. And Heavenly Father, we know that from his heart and from his mindset and desire, Father, he's always done things that is pleasing in your sight. And Father, we know that from the beginning there was a truth there in terms of his intentions, and I'm sure he put that truth out. And Father, we pray, Father, that this strain and stress that is brought up on his family because of this relocation, Father, that, that Ileana will see that this is her, has, 